officially. Wow. Are, we, are we doing this? We're doing this thing. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, such as you may be if you are watching this, uh, welcome to Chapel Bell Curve Live. We're not calling this the Battle Hymnal because we're not going to break down any stats or any video, and also Josh and Graham are not in it. So this is a uh, Chapel Bell Curve adjacent video product. You can call it what you want. Mm -hmm. Today, I, Nathan Lawrence, your intrepid straight man host here today, um, <laughs> is going. Or is uh, I am joined by uh, Justin Bray, uh, my long-term CBC host and friend of the program, long-term uh, Patreon patron, and all-around good guy, Ian Boatman. Um, how say hello, Ian. Good to have you. Hello, everybody. Um, so we are here to talk about beer. So one thing that Justin and Ian have in common is mm -hmm. that they both used to work at breweries. Um, you, Ian is a former, I think, what, tap room employee at Southern Brewing for about a year, did some brewing, some keg cleaning. Uh, Justin was the former tap room manager of the, uh, of the main tap room at creature comforts there we go Took me a second. <laughs> there it is I got, got him there. got him there I, I i kept thinking at chapel bell curve i was like that's not a brewery hold on where, yeah where am i going to go this? i was uh, there when we did start chapel bell curve at least right yeah so there's that um so i guess we're gonna just taste talk about um how to taste beer uh how how to think about tasting beer how just some some of the more uh, intricacies of having a beer palette. This is not something that I'm incredibly familiar with, so I'm excited to be y'all's pitch guy, y'all's co-host <laughs> here. Um, we're going to taste four beers today, um, and we can go over those in just a moment, and then we're going to talk about them. So, yeah, uh, Justin, you want to you wanna get us going here? Yeah, I would love to. So, first and foremost, you know, we wanted to talk about this because beer is so integral to so many parts of life um, for a lot of people. Um uh, especially tailgating football, uh, the overall experience. It is a facet of the football experience for many people. And so we thought, since we don't have a game now, <laughs> we are going to talk about something else that has to do with football, uh, which really for us is we beer. We didn't record that preview. Yeah, really we got really we close. We preview. got really close to recording the preview and put it off uh, to a point where it was almost too late to record it all. And so here we are talking about beer instead. But um, I will also preface this whole show with, um, and we'll, you'll hear us all say this many times, I'm sure, is that your taste is your experience, and there is no wrong way to drink and taste beer, um, and you're going to see that today, too, between the three of us, um, between Ian, who was trained at Southern Brewing Company to taste and enjoy beer, me, who was trained at Creature Comforts to taste and enjoy beer, and Nathan, who is a, a self-admitted uh, synesthesiast, synesthesiac? What would you call it, Nathan? <laughs> person with synesthesia yeah there you go i was hoping there was just a noun for it but apparently there's not so uh you'll get some other different notes from him but we'll all have different notes um if you're following along at home uh we have four different beers we're going to try we're going to try the wild leap chance ipa uh the dogfish head 60 minute ipa the cigar city maduro brown ale and then the academia pineapple schick breck berliner vice um which uh, we have some it's what it is technically synesthes 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 Okay. Like as an athlete. Oh, you know, <laughs> you're like a brain athlete. Um, but yeah. there are some alternatives for each of these beers. Some of them can be difficult to find, especially if you're not a, a local to Athens listener. Um, all of these are around the, the Georgia um, area. Um, Cigar City being the furthest away in Florida. I think they're in Tampa City. Tampa? Tampa City is not a place, just Tampa, right? Uh, <laughs> um, but we'll try all of these and we'll have some alternatives that we'll be trying along the way as well. Um, but yeah, we wanted to hop right into here. Um, and before we do that, let's, let's go ahead and start getting our first beer ready. Um, and I wanted to ask Ian while we're doing that, kind of tell us a little bit more about, um, when you were working at Southern Brewing Company, what sort of things would you do when y'all were, were tasting beer, um, what was the environment? What did it look like? What was asked of you? That sort of thing is kind of what I want to um, ask and understand. Yeah, so um, I worked at Southern Brewing Company for uh, uh, just about a year. <clears throat> Started there in uh, the summer of 2018 and went through the summer of 2019 in between semesters of graduates. Uh, started in the tap room staff um, and eventually kind of towards in the, in the later end of my tenure there, if you will. 
uh, started cleaning kegs and um, working um, as a beer tender at SBC, uh, that inspired me to start homebrewing. Um, so actually a really good friend of mine that I've known since preschool, Dylan Rose, shout out to Dylan Rose. We have our own home brewing project. We call Rose Boat Brewing. And um, my inspiration for home brewing uh, really got me going on that because of working at SBC. And a lot of the folks over there knew that, that I was getting into home brewing, so they actually let me brew on some of their professional equipment. Uh, so I actually got to help out make uh, the Midnight Train Porter, Red and Black Berliner, which is very popular around Athens right now. Um, and so I got to really experience a few different things outside of just serving beer uh, to the people of Athens, Georgia. Um, and um, um, when you hang around a bunch of beer nerds like that, you pick up on a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, so we would sit there and, and, and interrogate beers and talk about what we tasted, what we smelled, and how dramatically things were different from mm -hmm. one beer to the next. Or just in the same beer, if you had a sample of a certain recipe that was six months old versus that was six weeks old, for example. Um, so probably a somewhat similar experience to what uh, Justin had at Creature. Um, we got to experience a wide variety of different uh, beers and really experiencing oh, yeah. what the craft world is all about. Yeah. And there's just so many different ways to, to make craft drinks and foods and things like that. Like a lot of people think about going to a restaurant and trying a certain dish made a lot of different ways. Beer and wine and coffee are all very similar in that way that the whoever's crafting it can make it very differently than another person. But also there's so much more that goes into it, like the, the place that it's made, um, the water that it's made with, the place that the hops are grown and the wheat or the malts or everything that goes into it is just so it can be so different and can make such subtle or huge differences um, and we'll talk about that a little bit too with a couple of these beers specifically the florida beer to the the georgia beers um, and, and we'll see the differences there but um, yeah the first beer we're going to try is the wild leap chance ipa uh, this is a beer you've most likely heard me talk about and then nathan talk about um, and you should be talking about it too, because I think it's one of the best beers on the market right now. Um, it is a, a lower ABV IPA, um, IPA meaning India pale ale. Um, I'm going to go as like bottom, no knowledge. If you're a brand new beer drinker and this is the first time you've ever drank beer is what you're, you're kind of going to get, um, is what we're going to talk about here. We might dive deeper into it as people have questions, but, um, this is on the lower end of IPAs. Uh, it's a 6.2% ABV. Um, something that I enjoy about IPAs, uh, specifically, I like the lower ABV IPAs. Typically, um, those are the IPAs that are going to be a bit drier, and that means the opposite of sweet. So there's a spectrum between super dry and super sweet, um, and, and dry just meaning not sweet is the idea there. Um, the lower ABVs tend to have a lot less sugar, um, and the reason being, uh, there's a lot of reasons, but the main reason is because yeast, one of the four ingredients that goes into beer, it loves to eat sugar and then it, it poops out um, carbon dioxide and alcohol is the idea. And so ideally, if you your yeast has eaten all the sugar that you've given it to eat, you will have uh, an end point where it's done um, not brewing, it's done fermenting, um, not the words I'm looking for right now, but... Um, and that'll be the, the end result. So when your beer gets to the can, the yeast is not continuing to make more alcohol or CO2. If it was making more CO2, it would explode. Um, and so that is where it should be. So typically speaking, a lower ABV is going to be a drier, easier to drink um, beer itself. But um, we're all having our beers in cans, but we're also pouring them into little glasses or different kinds of glasses. We all have different kinds here. Um, You'll also notice if you've ever been to a brewery, a lot of times they have a uh, dish like glass rinsers. And the reason being is because you can have soap scuzz in glasses that you don't see or notice or smell even. Um, you could have dust accumulate in glasses. That's also important. So even at home, just give your glass a quick rinse um, and then pour into your glass. Um, and you'll want by the end of it, a good, a, a well poured beer is going to have about an inch of foam. That foam is good. That is also beer. It's called the head. Um, if you go to a brewery and someone says, "Well, you you didn't give me all my beer," <laughs> uh, that is part of the beer, and it's part of the tasting experience too, especially when you start sniffing. Um, and we're going to talk about a little bit through the way we want you to taste beer, at least in this experience. And I would encourage everybody to try it at least once um, to kind of understand and break down beer but 
you'll see Ian is, is Ian, what are you doing right now? I saw you moving your glass around and trying to find a light in the room. What is the first thing you do when you look at beer or, or try to understand it? So beer, as with anything, applies to the five senses. And with me personally being a very visual person, a lot of craft beers are also like this. First thing that catches your eye is the look of the beer. Um, you talk about the foam and the collar and the head that you get. It's one of the first things that you notice. Outside of the head, you also look at um, the rest of it. Hold it up to the line, get a really good intimate view of what the color is. Um, color in beer is very, very different. All right? You got your lagers, you got your IPAs, you got your stouts. All of those are going to look different. Even within the same style, they're going to be different. Not every IPA looks the same. So you want to get a really uh, detailed, intimate view of what it is. Is it more translucent? Can you kind of see through it more? Or is it more cloudy? Or a lot of times a big buzzword that we use is hazy. Mm -hmm. um, this one has a good, uh, beautiful, hazy color to this, very golden. Um, and then you start getting into the smell and the notes. Mm -hmm. um, so gotta... I'll just take a second and just really get into this. Yeah. And so as Ian's going through that, I want to ask Nathan a few questions as our, our resident straight man in this episode. Um, before Nathan's already drinking his, which is a okay. Um, those of you at home, if you want to pause here, if you're watching it, not live, we're going to start talking about things that we're smelling and tasting. And so the power of suggestion is so real that we want to make sure that you're given chances to taste and smell on your own. And then we can kind of converse back and forth in this, uh, in this medium. But the very first thing you want to do is put your nose like in the beer, not in it, in it, but like as close to it as you can to get some good sniffs immediately. You want to do two short sniffs and that'll get a lot of the esters, which are kind of the flavor compounds that are coming off of the yeast. Um, the yeast gives off different flavors. The water, the way it interacts with the malts gives off different flavors. The hops give off different flavors, how the hops were used, whether they were put into the boil early or they were put into dry hop later in the fermentation process. It all gives different kind of flavors. And those two short sniffs are going to give you those esters, the yeast compounds. So um, Nathan, stick your schnoz in there and tell me what you smell. It could be as simple or as robust as you want it to be. I uh, really associate this beer with, I, I'm sorry, like I don't know how to talk about um, <laughs> sensory experiences without talking about narratives, so I'm Good. sorry. That's why um, you're here. I get... Well, okay, so very a lot of fresh hops, a lot of grapefruit for me. Mm -hmm. and, and not just grapefruit, but there's like a very specific smell to fresh citrus, like off the tree citrus, and I get a lot of that. Yeah. Like that like really fresh, like citrus rind uh, zest kind of oil. Um, and you don't really even get it with like store-bought. Like if you've ever picked like an orange or a grapefruit and then ate it immediately, I get a lot of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe like, like there's a lot of like kind of woody fresh hops. It's I don't have the vocabulary for this. I don't know if it's like I'm getting something wood. Yeah, that's um, that's good. Yeah, and I can kind of let me break that down a little bit more. So those of you that may feel intimidated by this process, don't. Again, your taste and your experience, your perception is your reality, and it's right. Um, it's all valid. But um, one thing that I try to explain to people when I would train, train new uh, bartenders and that sort of thing, I would tell them to start small and then to build on that. If you smell something like citrus, say citrus, and then ask yourself next time you try it again, well, what kind of citrus? You know, I've tried a lot of different kinds of citruses. I've tried lemons and limes and grapefruits. Um, say those three things. Those are the three most immediate things. And then once you start trying new things and drinking it more and understanding it more, you can start saying real bougie things like blood orange and passion fruits, um, which are things that I'm about to say, and I apologize in advance, but my experience is valid. Like, <laughs> like overwhelming citrus juiciness. Absolutely. It is juicy in a way that I, it's, I feel like IPA, juicy IPAs are like, sort of an oversaturated market at this point mm -hmm. and this one does the juicy thing without being like uh over an overly ridiculous hot bomb or like yes. too bitter and and it's <laughs> it's so hard for it to taste yeah well i just drink like half yeah. from now. <laughs> it's still i feel like um one of the big mistakes with fruity ipas with juicy ipas is like it's so hard to get your citrus taste to taste fresh and yes. that like chance i mean i'm biased chance is one of my favorite beers but like it always tastes like fresh citrus to me. It never mm -hmm. tastes like like old 
like bitter citrus. So I'll tell you Sorry. why real quick, actually, and why I really love this beer. And I have not even t- tasted it yet. Um, but there's a lot of reasons why, especially with IPAs and these more hop forward beers. Hops are super susceptible to one of the f- a few of the things that uh, beer hates the most being oxygen, um, heat and uh, light. And luckily, it's in a can, so it's not going to be an issue. Um, cans are great conductors of heat, unfortunately. Um, and in the process of putting your beer in the can and getting it to where it's going to be bought and consumed by you, uh, you know, it can sit with that little tiny bit of oxygen left in the can, and also it can be sat in a truck or wherever, you know, on a grocery store floor. Um, you want to buy your beers just like you would buy your milk. You want to look at the expiration date, make sure that it's not something that's out of date. A lot of times beers will, on the side of the can or the box, give you a date when it's best drank by. Typically, um, for smaller craft breweries, um, that is three months from when it's been brewed. Um, And for me personally, I really love drinking IPAs, especially these hop-forward, fruitier, hazier ones like this, um, about a month out from when they've been brewed because those hops begin to oxidize and deteriorate over time. And so you're going to get a much better beer uh, because of that. For a lot of people, they say they don't like hoppy beers, but I think that um, actually what they don't like is that oxidation and they don't like crummy old beers. (laughs) And so if you're getting fresher beers, which this one typically is, um, you're going to have a better time all around. Well, if you can, if you can get it at all, it's, if you can get it at all, if you can't get it a lot of places. Um, And so one other thing Ian was just doing, he was smelling his shoulder. Uh, or his elbow. When you do that, it kind of helps to reset your olfactory senses. Uh, you smell really? yourself the most. And so that is going to help you reset. Just like some people oh. think um, smelling coffee at the perfume store, that sort of thing. It's similar to that, except coffee would totally wreck your senses in this specific experience. Um, the next step of the beer tasting process, the thing I didn't say. So we got the two sniffs. The next thing you would want to do is give it one long sniff, and that gives you some more flavor. Um, And then there's one specific thing. If you want to get everything really concentrated and smell everything as best you can, you can put your hand over it and give it some, some uh, kind of some shakes to start to agitate it. And once you kind of get that head back on there, um, you kind of see it's getting a little thicker. I will take my hand off and sniff it all. And you're going to get everything really concentrated and all that resininess that you were talking about, Nathan, that's in there that like pine sap that is uh, pretty typical of uh, IPAs and hops, uh, fresh, like dry hopped hops. Um, those are all going to be in there as well. But um, then we'll taste it. Um, a lot of people will taste it like they taste wine. They'll swish it back and forth, that sort of thing. Go nuts if you want to do that. Um, I do like to let it sit on my, my my tongue and my mouth and let it warm up a little bit. As beer warms up, just like anything else, or cools down, um, it'll begin to taste different. So um, I am going to taste this, and I'm going to throw it back to Ian to tell us a little bit more about this and break it down in his own words. Yes. Um, first of all, yes, good point with me sniffing the sleeve i'm not smelling my pits here let's be clear about that (laughs) smelling the shirt sleeve bring your your um your nostrils and your palate back to neutral so you can kind of go about that because if you're doing this over and over again your nose and your mouth can get a little overloaded and it can be time to bring it back so uh nathan the really interesting point that you made about the rind citrus uh the oil of the rind specifically coming off the nose here that's awesome um and i i did not pick up on that first time but I am starting to kind of pick up on that after you said that. Now, I don't know if it's just kind of the bias that you brought up with that. I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 I can get that too. But I, I really think that I, I do. Um, I really just get a ton of grapefruit with this more than anything. It's, it's a blast of grapefruit as soon as it hits my nose. Um, that deeper nose, after the two short sniffs, with the long sniff, I get more tangerine out of that. Mm-hmm. I get some more tangerine that's teased out of that, which balances out some of the, the grapefruit which is nice for me because I'm typically not the biggest grapefruit person in the world. So that's a good balance. Um, good tropical notes here. Um, just by the nose alone, you don't even have to try it. This gives you good vibes of a good pool beer, good beach beer. Um, I get a little bit of cantaloupe uh, in it, uh, mm-hmm. especially the longer sniff. Um, but it, it really is uh, grapefruit dominated. Um, now again, there's no wrong answer here. You know, I mentioned cantaloupe. Nobody else might be getting cantaloupe out of it. So yeah. If that's the case, perfectly normal. Perfectly normal. Um, in the taste, Wild Leap advertises this one as being drinking. 
you can see why. Yeah. Um, this is one of the easier drinking IPAs that are out there. Um, for those that are watching and listening along, here, you might not be an IPA person. Or if you are, perhaps you're brand new to the IPA world and you're just kind of experimenting with some things. I'd say this is a good starter IPA, if you will. The nose will kind of fool you into thinking that you're drinking something a little bit more bold and a little bit stronger. But the taste and the way it goes down is easier than you think. The grapefruit and the orange really come out here uh, when you go to taste it. Um, I got something when I tasted this a couple days ago. When the, and this was the first time I've had this beer in several months, so I kind of forgot some things. Mm -hmm. But as the beer continues to warm here, when I had this a few days ago, I got more licorice out of it. And I don't know exactly where that came from. Is that something from the hops? I'm not really sure exactly where that is, uh, but I wonder if I will get more licorice here now as the beer continues to warm as I drink. That is, it's funny you say licorice. That's something I had identified as I, I put the beer in my mouth, let it sit there for a second. I swished around a little bit. It tasted a little bit more like, um, like, uh, overripe, like pineapple and, and just straight passion fruit. But I definitely see how that overlaps into the world of licorice as well. Um, one thing I'll add, getting, do what? I, I get a little like caraway, Okay. Ever, like, have you ever been to like an Indian restaurant where they have like caraway seeds that you can eat as like a breath freshener? Yeah. I get a little bit of like star anise kind of like herbiness. Okay. See, look at Nathan go talking about how he doesn't have the language for it. I I, I eat a lot of food, so we can get into. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I'll add to the tasting experience, another uh, to kind of wrap it all up. Once you started drinking it, tasting it. Beer changes after two beers even, um, you know, obvious reasons. But um, when you put the beer in your mouth, keep it in there for a second, let it warm up. And then as you swallow it, don't breathe out of your mouth the first time. Breathe out of your nose and it pushes everything back through your nose. Uh, the reason why we start drinking beer by sniffing it and looking at it is because that sets the tone for how it's going to go. Just like Nathan, you would sit and you would see some uh, the way someone's dished a plate of a food um, that kind of sets you up for the experience before you actually eat it. Um, with our nose, though, you want to be able to smell it because that kind of tells you a little bit more about it. Um, but it works in tandem with taste. But I would I would encourage everybody, you're going to get different notes from the nose. You'll get different notes by drinking it. You'll get different notes by breathing out of your mouth, your nose, that olfactory breathing. Uh, it's it's different all the way through. Um, and, and one thing, um, go ahead. What is the word for... I feel like the finish of this beer, mm -hmm. like when, which I, I'm pretty sure is the word for like how it tastes as you swallow it, mm -hmm. uh, is, I don't know the word. It tastes like, like it's very effervescent. It's very like fizzy on the way down, which is weird because it doesn't taste very carbonated at any other time. And I don't really have, it kind of tastes like how it tastes to swallow Sprite that's just been opened. <laughs> I got that. Okay. It, I see what you're saying. Very, like, yeah, okay, there's got to be a better word for that, but it's like it like I get a lot of the carbonation on the way down. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. I think you have a note about so actually, that, Ian. Uh, yeah, I, I did mention now. I don't know the specific term for that or even if there is a term. So I might be missing something there with you along along with you on that. Um one thing that I noticed when I uh tried this a few days ago, um you're correct that you don't really get a lot of fix. When mm -hmm. you, you know, go through the thing. Yeah, it, it goes down smoother than what you would typically think beer to have. Um, a really good note about that, carbonation can be both your friend and your enemy depending on the context of the beer. Mm -hmm. um, I really love the fact in this case that they did not really pump a lot of CO2 into this, which aids into the overall softness of the beer. Um, it's an IPA, but it's not a very harsh one where the hot just knock you out. The fruit brings that sweetness and the softness element to it and gives you the overall drinkability of the beer, even though it's an IPA. Um, CO2 in general can cloak good or bad flavors. So the wonderful fruit flavors of this really shine through here because they dial back the CO2 mm -hmm. in ways that if you overcarbonate it, if you really have a good flavor in your beer, because you have so much fizz, it can kind of take back some of that stuff. So if you sit there and watch a good craft brewer or a professional to see what they're doing, you'll watch them swish around the glass a little bit, you know, like it's wine or liquor. 
and you're thinking, wait, what are you doing? You're getting rid of the carbonation. That's actually the point because the carbonation can actually cloak some of those flavors. So you might actually have a really good flavor in a beer, but you're kind of cutting your nose to spite your face because you're over carving the heck out of it. Mm -hmm. So that could be an issue. It can also be on the other side of the spectrum where the carbonation can actually mask some of the bad flavors. So if a craft brewer wants to call you out on some things, they can swish it around, get rid of the carbonation, which masks some bad flavor, some off flavor, and then they go to drink it and say, oh, found it, carbonation mm -hmm. hit it. Um, so that's something that's really uh, a great point to bring up this beer that I'm glad um, that Nathan pointed out here. CO2 can be your friend and your enemy or, or in this case. And I love the fact that they did not over carve it because you really get the softness and the sweetness. Of it. Absolutely. And um, <clears throat> you brought up so many good points. Like I, I love, this is why I love talking about beer because you can really talk about beer forever. And there's so many little things that if you've never worked at a brewery or talked about it or um, been in like the behind the scenes and spoken to somebody who knows a lot about it, you might miss all these little nuanced details about beer. Um, Cause CO2, CO2 has a flavor and you might not know carbonic acid has a flavor, but it does. And it's not just the, that, uh, that mouthfeel you get from the CO2, the bubbles and everything, but that's definitely, I'm glad that you brought it up, Nathan, cause it wasn't even in my notes about talking about the mouthfeel and uh, cause that's a real thing. That's something you, you get used to talking about being at a brewery. And for the first month you're there, you say mouthfeel so many times that it stops being funny and just a thing, it becomes part of your vernacular. But that mouthfeel can be so many things. It can be the way the CO2 sits on your, your tongue. There can be big bubbles. There can be little bubbles. There can be tons of tiny bubbles. Um, but this one has, I would say, like pretty small um, bubbles. And, and like uh, Ian's saying, these come and go pretty fast. Uh, and and it's, kind of like a, it's kind of like a brewer flex in the sense that they don't need anything extra. The beer speaks for itself. It's doing what it wants to do. And uh, another really interesting thing about the fermentation process, I mentioned it a second ago that CO2 is a natural byproduct of yeast eating sugar. Um, but oftentimes, it, just about any brewery at this point will force carbonate their beers and they'll have a standard uh, level of CO2 so that uh, every beer you have tastes the same from them. It's like going to McDonald's and getting the cheeseburger. It's going to be the same cheeseburger every time. That's the goal of any brewer or chef they want every plate everything they make to be the same every time and so uh it, it meets a certain standard of excellence you man, know, oh, man. You want to do another one yeah i do I we're gonna move on to what's that more thoughts to close yeah please um, okay yeah I love, how, I love how this one the aftertaste it's here then it's gone that's not that common uh, for the IPAs that I typically have. Yes. So I really like yeah. this. That's why I say that this is a good starter IPA for those that are interested in kind of getting into that. Um, one other little turn that I can throw at you guys, if you want to impress your friends. I noticed with Justin, he actually had a little bit more of this, so it might depend on the batch. You tip some of the beer on the side of your glass, you can watch the bubbles. Mm -hmm. right? So when I tip it over the side of the glass, I have a little bit of bubbles that, that are there on the side, but then they kind of erode away and they fall back down. There's a, there's a specific term for this. It's called lacing. The bubbles lacing around the glass. If you want an extreme example of this, go pop open a bottle of Guinness or any um, beer that is made with nitrogen instead of uh, carbonation. We call mm -hmm. those nitro beers. A Guinness is such a perfect extreme example of that because every time you drink, uh, yeah, every time you have a sip of a pint of Guinness, there is a ring of lacing that remains on the glass. And you get a new ring each time you take a sip. By the time you finish your average pint of Guinness, I think there's like seven to eight lines of lacing around the glass. Oh, yeah. I noticed this a few days ago, and I notice it now. I do not have a lot of lacing. But it kind of looked like Justin had a little bit more than I did. A little bit. I mean, you can kind of see it. It's not a ton. Um, but, it, yeah, it's a, it's a beer that comes and goes pretty fast. Um, yeah. One thing that y'all will see, especially in these East Coast, Northeastern IPAs, this is an example of a Northeastern style IPA. It's kind of hazy, but it's a lot drier than those hazy IPAs. Um, and we'll talk about another kind of IPA in a second with the dogfish head. But this, uh, you'll see sometimes some IPAs say with lactose, and that is that that dairy uh, sugar, that milk sugar. Um, it's not necessarily going to, I'm lactose intolerant, but it's not going to affect me in that way. If a beer has lactose, 
that is beer that is sugar that has been added it's a residual sugar and after the fermentation so after the yeast has eaten all the sugar they add more to either cut alcohol because it has so much in it or they do it to make the mouth feel softer like this one this one has no lactose but it has the kind of mouth feel they've achieved that northeastern like soft cloudy pillowy ipa feel without it being eight or nine percent which is really nice uh, and that's why i really like it have you guys ever had heady topper Oh yes, <laughs> this 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 beer reminds me of Hetty Topper, uh, not in terms of how it tastes, but just uh, that's I think the genius of Hetty Topper, which is this for the if you're not a white dude with a beard, Hetty Topper is like the ultimate chase uh, craft beer that's like sold in like six places in New Hampshire or something, mm -hmm. um, and this reminds me of Hetty Topper in the sense that they're both beers that are just so like balanced. Like, I always think about, like, mouth shape when I drink an IPA. And, like, if you have an IPA that is too skunky or too hop forward, like, you get a really tight mouth shape because you can't drink it without, even even if you drink a lot of IPAs, you can't drink it without kind of being like, oh, fuck. Like, it's kind of just like <laughs> your mouth rebels against the bitterness. Uh -huh. um, and this is one of those beers that is just, like, a very round mouth shape for me. And it's very yes. similar where it's, like, very balanced. There's nothing in too much proportion. Um, it's, a very, it's a very subtly drawn beer, I think. Yeah. Um, anyway, that's true though. And Hetty Topper, uh, is, is one of those first big, uh, hazy IPAs. They kind of start, they helped start that hazy IPA craze, um, that is still going on today, uh, albeit just a little bit, uh, less than it was. Um, uh, but yeah, let's, before we, uh, get too far in the weeds about this one beer, let's, let's go ahead and move on so we can start talking, um, about the other three beers we still have. <laughs> so if y'all want to grab the next one, guys, we gotta go yeah. faster. we're moving, what are we doing uh, next? We're doing uh, Berliner Weiss. You'll grab red and black. Okay. And I'll, I'll set us up a little bit. Um, so Ian flexed on us, and he grabbed the Academia uh, Pineapple Shipwreck Berliner Weiss, which was really difficult to find. Somehow he found it, and I live in the damn city that Academia is, um, and I couldn't find it. Um, Nathan has a different Ber Berliner Weiss, and I have the Athena Berliner Weiss. But this will be really good because it's going to help uh, the conversation about this. Um, because Berliner Weiss is such a versatile type of beer, versatile style of beer, you can do so much with it. It really takes very well to fruits um, and different things like that. You'll A lot of times you'll find beers that are super acidic, um, very tart, that are naturally fermented that they've put fruit into, which is fine. That lends itself to it as well. This is more. This is not a naturally fermented beer. Um, for me, a, 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 uh, especially... Um, Athena is what's called a kettle soured, uh, kettle acidified specifically is what the brewers would want you to call it because it's not necessarily souring in the kettle, it is acidifying. So if you remember back to high school uh, chemistry class, you had um, the pH scale. This is on the acidic side of the pH scale. And so that's why it becomes so tart and intense. But it has um, lots of, of very nice uh, like weedy malts and um it's typically very, it tastes weedy. It tastes like biting into bread, but then it comes and goes so quickly because of the, the lemon tartness that is pretty uh, indicative um, to Berliner Weisses. But I'm going to have the Athena Berliner Weiss. Um, Nathan has the Red and Black from um, Ian's Old Haunt, Southern Brewing Company. And uh, Ian has the Pineapple Shipwreck Berliner Weiss that we're all going to end up trying. Are, are, we, are we pouring these? Go for it. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to have a little bit of water, which I would encourage if you're following along at home, just have some water just to kind of wash out what you just tried. Um, you would not typically try these four very different beers um, back to back like this because they are so different and you're going to miss some of the nuance in some of these beers if you're trying them this way. But we're going to yeah, I drink like we're make it happen. Of a visco are we doing red and blacks together here yet? Looks like I it. I could not resist. It's my favorite, my favorite <laughs> beer of all time. Ooh, I got a, I got a fresh batch here. So, um, Ian, you can help me uh, with this and kind of speak to Southern Brewing Companies, the way that they made their red and black, and I think their wild azalea as well. But I think that those are very different beers, um, if I'm remembering correctly. But um, Athena is a funny Berliner Weisses in general are a funny beer because their yeast is introduced, a bacteria is introduced um, twice in the process of making this beer. So. 
beer is essentially what I like to tell people. It's just dirty. It's, it's oatmeal water. It's like dirty water, just like coffee is. Um, you put a bunch of water in a, a vat and then you put a bunch of wheat or malt or whatever you want to put in there and you boil it a bunch and then uh, you throw hops and other shit in there too. But uh, Athena specifically and Berliner Weisses in general, you make that dirty oatmeal water and then you throw in the bacteria called lactobacillus and it begins to eat the naturally occurring sugars in the wheat right then and there and you let it sit for a while until it meets the acid level on the ph scale that it wants um excuse me man i have all kinds of burps now and then they finish the beer um with uh they still pitch yeast into the uh the wart is what it's called that's a funny word that i haven't used yet um beer that is not yet beer is called wart um just like the little things you get on your fingers and toes uh but yeah we're going to each try these different berliner vices i have the the basic one essentially um and y'all have the some fruited variants. So let's try to smell these guys and we can compare notes as we go, I guess. So y'all may be getting some very different uh, things than I am, obviously. Um, the very first thing I noticed about it, of course, my Berliner Weiss is they're typically very light straw, very pale yellow. Um, that academia looks like it's pretty similar though. The CO2 looks like it's all kind of gone. Um, the really great thing about Athena, the head is very persistent. It stays forever, which is not actually uh, typical of a lot of, uh, Berliner vices. Yeah. You can see this one's already pretty much. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. My red blood is completely gone. Um, So what are y'all smelling? What are you, what are you getting over there? Um, Go first, I mean, obviously you get raspberry and uh, blackberry. Uh, the two things I get out of this are, I don't know if you guys have ever done canning, uh, but this smells like jelly. It, it's like very jammy, um, but I, for in particular, it kind of smells like pectin to me. Pectin mm -hmm. is like a, a fruit sugar used in canning. Um, and I don't know if that has to do with like, uh, cause I know this actually, there's berries, actual real berries involved in the process here. And when you cook berries, you get this like uh, thing that is in the cell walls of the fruit called pectin. And that's what it smells like to me. Also, uh, when you get, when you pick really flat, fresh blackberries, they tend to have like a little like, um, woodiness to them. And I get some of that like fruit stem a little bit. Um, which again, I think is probably from just cooking down all of the like actual plant cells in, uh, the berries. Uh, and man, this one is like, just like a massive fruit bomb. It, it's oh, yeah. like almost even hard to smell like the lactic acid, like the, the milk sugars at all. Like it's a lot of fruit sugar. It's like very much, you know what this really smells a lot like is mama's boy raspberry jam. Mm. And I, and I actually... I actually think that that is because, and I don't know, I know a lot about canning. I know nothing about making beer. But anytime you cook down any kind of fruit, uh, especially berries, there's a specific fruit sugar that comes out. Um, and you add fruit sugar to jelly to make jelly more stable when you're canning it. Um, and I actually think that that's what, like, is at the front of this. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Very that's my can. Canting, my, my, that's my canning take. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Ian? Oh, also, y'all are talking about the fruits in red and black, but what are the fruits in it? Raspberries and blackberries. Yep, we, um, we, can I still say we? Sure. Um, <laughs> we, or maybe SBC, or whoever you want to call it. Um, Southern Brewing Company takes their flagship Berliner Weiss, which is called Southeastern Berliner. Um, used to be able to find it more in cans. It's gotten a little more rare. Uh, over the years, uh, they still do. Good. They still do have it on tap. As I see on the website, I have the website pulled up right now, and Southeastern Winter is still there, so you can head up two thirty one College Industrial Boulevard and <laughs> Southeastern Winter. But they use that as the base, and that is the base uh, for red and black. And they load it up with raspberries and blackberry, and really nothing else in the rest. Of it. Um, so is it? Black, um, can I ask you before you continue about the red and black? Um, is it? 
fruits that you would just find out in the yard or in a bush or how does it what does it look like when it goes into the beer so it comes from a local farm and i do not remember where that's okay i was, I was told this and i can't remember um the, the fruit has sometimes looked a little bit different mm-hmm. in different batches that i've seen um one thing that I've noticed about red and black, and I, I say this as someone who's still very, very casual. I'm not the professional brewers, not on their level, in the very least. But it seems like to me that red and black is a tough one to celebrate. And I would imagine the fruit, what quality the fruit you get, and how you put it in there can vary some of that. Um, I've seen it more you know, dry, so to speak. I've seen it in a few different ways. Um, so I don't know if there's one specific key thing that they want out of that. Um, this, um, and I, I'm contrasting it with uh, pineapple shipwreck here from uh, Academia. And pineapple shipwreck resembles more of your, what I would consider a classic Berliner in sourness. Red and black is a lot more tart than it is sour. Very, very yeah, sour. I, it, and the... it, it has been a long time since I've drank this alongside another Berliner. And red and black is now like super duper sweet, and I can this. <laughs> very much so. This is the first time I've I... had an Athena in in a very long time. Like, this brought me back to sitting at tasting panel at Creature Comforts, tasting Athenas, like different batches of Athenas. And Athena uh, reminds it's me wild. of when when we were at Creature Comforts in the freezer that one time. <laughs> Not. <laughs> You're going to have to, like, build on that. You're not just going to, like, drop that and be like, that one time you and I met in the freezer, Justin. Yeah, well, I mean, after we made Sweet Passionate Love, we had, <laughs> we had Athena's. So, uh, I, I, remember, I just recall one time that we were there at close and we drank a bunch of weird beer um, mm-hmm. that was, like, you know, brewers batches and just, like, weird experiments. And I think some of it was some, like, weird alternate takes of Athena. One thing I, I think is interesting about, I really associate Berliner Weiss with that. Almost like, um, you know, there's that compound that is in like vomit that some yes. people have like a really, that are really like, some people really can taste it. Mm-hmm. There is a little bit of that like milky sort of like, like acidity to a lot of Berliner Weisses. And what I think is crazy about red and black is like, it, that that is just not there like red and black is juicy but not in the like ipa sense of juicy it just tastes like juice um and a lot of that i think is uh it is un like real fruit juice is like unreplicable taste wise mm-hmm. like if you actually put fruit in something it like it's like the difference between like fake jelly that you buy off the off the thing and then off the you know shelf and then jelly that you make yourself right like any kind of fresh fruit thing will always take more, more, mm-hmm. taste more like fruit. I think that's kind of the like genius of it. Anyway, so something uh, that reminds me of the the that vomit flavor, that compound is actually it's a naturally occurring flavor in lactobacillus. It's called right, yeah. butyric acid, uh, and it, it is naturally occurring in milks and dairies and butter, all those different things that that can kind of spoil and get weird. And it's funny you say that because that is a, that is an off flavor in beers that can happen. Um, which is not something you want someone to say, but it is definitely there and it's naturally occurring. Um, the other, we were, we, we learned a lot of the names of the different flavor compounds in, in beer. Um, there's a, a very strong green apple flavor in Athena specifically. Um, and I want to say, and I could be wrong, but I think it's uh, acid aldehyde, which is also a very similar um, flavor compound and, and like kind of nose um, that you would find in fingernail polish, but you don't want it to be that but it's a naturally occurring thing is that's something that brewers have to deal with is when they're making beer they have to identify those flavors and those compounds and say oh that reminds me of this other thing like what you just said it reminds me of vomit <laughs> and so how can i make well, this I mean, beer taste less like vomit to the average like, person is what they're kind of trying to do my wife is i think like a super taster for butyric acid like she mm-hmm. can't eat uh brown butter because really? when the like yeah like when the solids are cooked off of it it just tastes like vomit to her and i think that's why she likes red and black so much because it's a sour beer that has like like not even a touch of that like none um because red and black is like one of the few beers that my wife will drink regularly so ian do you want to tell us a little bit about the the, the two beers that you have a little bit more yeah so um 
while we're talking about red and black and I work for them, <laughs> can't stop there. Um, the, the sweetness of all of that beer is why I love it so much because ironically, I'm not a sour beer person. Um, Athena was the first sour I ever had, the first Berliner specifically I ever had. And honestly, it did turn me off of sours for a while. Mm-hmm. Athena can kick you a little bit in the palate and that was the night of my 21st birthday and it just didn't sit well with me. Um, so it did turn me off of sours for a while. But ironically, ever since Red and Black, that is now my favorite beer of all, and it's a sour. So that's ironic for me. And it's really that sweetness of it that comes in, that, that kind of jam uh, part of it that really makes it for me. And I absolutely love that about that beer. Um, batches of Red and Black can differ. Um, mm-hmm. One thing about uh, Red and Black that can be kind of times is when we have trouble calibrating it, especially when you get to the top of the keg or the bottom of the keg, which is just would know sometimes that's a little weird. When you're in the more central part of the keg, that's like the sweet spot of the beer. Mm-hmm. But as uh, things get topped off and you fill the kegs, what you get at the top and at the bottom does not necessarily represent what the rest of the beer is. And sometimes when you see that in red and black, it would look like a smoothie. It would, yep. look, it would look a little lighter in color. It would look a little thicker. It would pour thicker. And it would taste kind of chalky sometimes. Um, so sometimes we would have to sit there and calibrate that in different and sometimes that would be out of our hands when we passed on to the brewers so they can do whatever magic that they do. Um, and sometimes red and black can also taste a little bit more like, uh, which is interesting. I remember um, I sat down with a one-on-one tape with Brian Roth. Mm-hmm. He's the co-founder of SBC. Wonderful guy. Love you, Brian Roth. I miss you very much. Hope you and Jim are, uh, are doing well. Um, and uh, he and I sat down once, and he gave me two different samples of red and black. One of them was very much like a wine flavor, and the other was more of the red and black that I'm used to drinking right now. For me. So it's, it's really crazy how that one – that one always seemed to vary more than a lot of other beers that I had on that um, at SBC. It was really interesting. How that one, I'm sure the fruit makes it um, interesting flavor. To Academia, uh, Pineapple Shipwreck. First of all, before we need to talk about anything, uh, if you guys haven't done yet, awesome. We got SpongeBob theme all the way around here, and yeah, SpongeBob is uh, getting Las Vegas. Right. <laughs> so I yeah. love the can. I think that is that's fantastic. a that's a Hunter S. Thompson reference. That's mm-hmm. the Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas uh, poster with SpongeBob. I that's terrifying. Gotten, that's that's an excellent reference. Or not a thought. That's good. So we have to appreciate the can. Oh yeah. The color, the color reminds me a little bit more of lager. It's a, a, a more of a straw uh, color, <clears throat> less golden than what we had with Bob Cancer. Um, a little cloudy with this one, but not hazy like what we had with uh, Wild Wild Chance. Um, you know, one thing that I uh, noticed in the color just now that I did not a couple days ago, champagne. This looks a lot like champagne, which funny that we're comparing this to Athena, for example, because mm-hmm. what do they call that? The champagne of the South, right? Yeah. Yeah. It tastes yeah. a lot like champagne. So this, well, this is interesting because I'm smelling a lot of champagne here and that did not occur. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's interesting how that just popped in my head. And I just had some champagne over the weekend. So, I'm, you know, who knows why that didn't come around the first time. Um, those uh, that, that short nose, the first two uh, two sniffs there. I get the sweetness and the lightness of coconut. Um, not heavy like coconut milk, but on the lighter side and more like coconut water, um, which is a, a nice light uh, feel to it, and it kind of tells you that you're going to be dealing with a lighter and not something on the heavier side. Um, pineapple becomes more pronounced in the longer sniff um, when you uh, bring it up to your mouth. Um, pineapple introduces more acidity to it. We mm-hmm. all know the pineapple juice in and of itself is very acidic. And... Um, that's a similar kind of vibe you get here. Pineapple and coconut, on the lighter side, you're thinking the beach. Right? So that's what I'm thinking. I live at the beach, for example. I'm seven miles away, so that works out well. Um, a lot of champagne on the nose. Again, this is something I just noticed now with the champagne that I did not get um, a couple days ago. So with the taste, that remains unchanged. A lot of pineapple juice dominates the, uh, the palate. I do not get... Um, pineapple juice really takes center stage here. 
Uh, Belinda Vice, as Justin mentioned earlier, is known as more of a sour style, but this is more tart than it is sour. Now, it is not tart on the same end as red and black is. That's a different kind of thing because that's berries. That's a different thing. This still brings you a nice balance of tart versus sour, which works out for me personally because, again, I'm typically that big of a sour beer person. Mm-hmm. So if I'm to have a sour, this is probably more my style. Um, the uh, the finish of it, I get more coconut, so that the initial hit on is pineapple juice. But after you swallow it and take in that aftertaste for a bit, that's when the coconut lingers in more, but just slightly. It's like a coconut coconut kiss, if you will. Something very slight. <laughs> it's very sweet. You also get a, a yes, a very sweet. Um, something that you get out of this, and I haven't had a fina in a while, but I seem to remember this one, fina. You get that that kind of a, a weedy almost bready cereal uh, cereal yeah appetizer. like shredded wheat yep uh that's that's typical uh for balloners out there that flavored ones especially not red and black but if you have more of a a, a neutral uh, non-fruited uh balloner you will have uh that typical aftertaste to it so even mm-hmm. though this does have a fruit character to it you still have some of that bready character that lingers out of you um the aftertaste in general hangs out a lot longer does for probably chance chance was gone within seconds this lingers uh for several minutes on the order of five to ten minutes. all right we gotta overall guys i hate to be the straight man here but we gotta we gotta like we do gotta move along i don't want to like i don't want to play you off but like we are an hour in and we're only two beers in here okay understandable the last um, things i'll say about um just athena as we're getting our next beer ready um, and just Berliner Weisses in general. Something I find really interesting about Berliner Weisses is, and, and beers in general is that um, beer in the way that we drink it and enjoy it has not been what it is uh, for very long uh, because beer um, naturally occurring is sour because for a long time we did not have a way to keep it from souring because of naturally occurring bacteria and yeast in the air and, and so on and so forth. And so if there's, a lot of wild yeasts and things like that introduced to the beer, it becomes sour on its own. And so Athena and other Berliner Weisses like it. They are more um, typical of what beer may have tasted like uh, many years ago, uh, less than 100 years ago, honestly, and less than maybe 60, 70 years ago. Um, so there's that. I also realized I did not grab a bottle opener for this next beer, so I'm going to find something on my desk. <laughs> to finagle this one open uh, we are trying next the a different kind of ipa we're trying a west coast ipa and i think we've got through most of like the a lot of the technical stuff at this point so we can start just kind of trying it and talking about the beer which is good um as they're getting things together i will go through some looks like there's some questions that kind of came through On the Discord, yeah, I'm plugging the Discord real quick. So if you uh, want to be a part of a really great community of people, it only costs a dollar a month to be a part of the Discord server, and all the money that we're making this season goes towards Dogs for Pups. Uh, at this point, they've stopped doing the Wi-Fi campaign, giving Wi-Fi to all the students in the the community. They're giving um, food to all those that need food um, or are in situations where they're more at risk of going hungry, and so all the money from that is going to that. All the revenue we make this season is going to that. So. Join us and meet a bunch of really awesome people that are watching this live right now. But a few of the questions um, looked like Kyle Sargent asked if there are any, he lives in Florida, like South, South Florida near Disney. And so he was asking if there are any widely available tasty sours. Um, Margarita Gosa. Gosa. Yeah. Uh, From Westbrook. Margarita Gosa. Oh, oh, oh yeah, no, Cigar City does. Cigar City, Cigar City yeah. from Florida does. Um, I think there's a Goza from Green Bench in Florida. I might be making that up. Mm-hmm. Um, Green Bench is a wonderful little brewery in St. Petersburg that I really enjoy. Um, they have a really great brown and a really great uh, pale ale and lager. Um, Pontoon, I think, is in southern Georgia that you might yeah, get. Yeah, Pontoon's, Pontoon's really good. I don't know if you can... You might not be able to get it, yeah. Um, and also, I might have to look, but um, if you can get anything from Funky Buddha, Funky Buddha is 
fucking weird <laughs> and everything they make is weird but they're all culinary inspired what's that they have a peanut butter one that's really good yeah they they have that and they also have just a bunch of different like sour ales and things like that that um you might be able to get a lot easier down there in uh florida than you would up here but i would definitely check that out um, so this is a one? this is a beautiful beer this is a very, very pretty beer. This is also an IPA. I'm going to hold it up to the camera because this is the same style as the first beer we tried, which was super hazy. Um, this is the Dogfish Head 60-minute IPA. The 60-minute IPA, the 60-minute portion of it um, refers to how long this beer, uh, before it was beer, it was wort, sat in the boil kettle. It was in the boil for 60 minutes. And so if uh, brewers, they keep the beer in the boil portion for an amount of time and it cooks the oats so it brings out um imagine you're cooking sugar and you're making caramel out of it and so the longer you cook cook the sugar the more it gets closer to caramel caramel is not the best example because if you cook it too long it burns but it's similar in that aspect that you're trying to bring out those more roasty notes um and dogfish head has a 90 and a 120 and i think they have a 30 minute now perhaps it's a session ipa um session meaning just a li lot lighter um and this one is a 6% alcohol. So this is a West Coast IPA. Um, and they typically have a much more forward malt um, flavor. This one has been very well filtered. So there's nothing left in there. I can see straight through it. But it's also, you can tell, it's a lot more like a brownish, like a, like a more golden look to it. Um, this is going to be um, sweeter more often because it's going to have a more of a malty back, backbone. Um, it's also going to have, uh, it might not have those flavors that you want. I think that Ian brought up a really good point that Chance is a really great inter entrance IPA because it is sweeter. It has more like fruit forward notes, whereas this is going to have a lot more like, it's going to taste like hops. <laughs> what do y'all think so far? I mean, you just, uh, this is, and correct me if I'm wrong, like this is like the, this is the, the standard like if you want to taste what a West I, West Coast IPA tastes like, this is one of the ones you would do, right? Like, yeah. And to me, it just smells like a brewery. Like it smells like malt, uh, a lot of hops. Um, it's it's surprisingly not hop forward for how much it smells like hops. Mm -hmm. Um, and I get like some like oat. Like there's a lot of real like like woodiness to it. Like. Mm -hmm. It kind of smells like if you stick your face into just like uh, one of those big cardboard tubes of Quaker Oats to me. Like it's really, <laughs> like, that's probably the malt or whatever, but it's like yeah. very like, you can really smell the like grassiness of it. For sure. And those are all perfect ways to describe an IPA, honestly. Um, what are you getting, Ian? <clears throat> I had this earlier today and I did not get a lot of malt. That no. First time. Now, very malty. Mm -hmm. um, interesting how that works, and that's all you know. It's coming from the six pack, the same same batch. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also coming from the bright fruitiness of a Berliner Weiss too. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, yeah, this is. Um, we mentioned earlier that Chance is a good starter. This is a good, I would think, a middle of the road proper. IPA. Yeah. You're yeah. more seasoned IPA folks are going to like this one. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the mouth of it, like the aftertaste is not too bad. Like this is not stone. Like if you drink mm -hmm. a stone IPA, you're going to taste hops for the next 72 hours. Yes. Like that's, that's all. And, but this is not that. And so it's, um, you get why it's sort of like the industry standard for this style because it's, uh, it's similarly well balanced. It's a little bit more hop forward, but it's not like, uh, you know, three day old coffee or anything. Yeah. And it is. So this to me also, it's funny you say coffee. Cause I do taste like a little bit of like fresh coffee, like ground coffee. Um, but what, what I think is funny about this, this is a good beer. This is a very well-made beer It is not my preference of beer, but it's a very well-made balanced beer. It doesn't linger too long. It doesn't overstay its welcome. Um, one thing I do think is neat about this is this taste to me like hops, good hop executioner. Like it's got a chewiness, but it's not so chewy in the hop 
profile that it lingers and lingers and lingers oh. and you're like uh, i want it to go away no oh, you're making now you just made me sad but yeah it does it does <laughs> yeah that was the that's the appeal of beers like hopsecution or beers like this is like the um if you've ever just like gotten a handful of fresh hops off the vine and like rubbed them in your hands and smelled mm -hmm. them it kind of smells like that like it tastes the way that smells if that makes sense like uh mm -hmm. there's a very like immediate sort of um i'm really trying to get through this entire broadcast and not say the word vegetal uh because no, i feel like that's, that's the good worst word in the world uh, well i mean that's like something that someone on bon appetites would say when they were ten dollars <laughs> stealing from a, a non-white person um but like it is, it is very like planty very veg fine mm -hmm. screw it it's, it's vegetal, vegetal. It, it is it is it it smells like grass almost to me and not pot but like actual grass like uh just the sort of like earthy uh plantiness of it which i, I really like and it, and it it balances with the malt like mm -hmm. i did not remember this beer being like super malty but like the smell of it like the nose the nose the nose is very malt and it's also this is what you want a, a typical normal west coast ipa to taste like it's supposed to be piney and resiny and those things you mentioned oh, yeah. earlier nathan and this is a great example of this is piney this is resiny this is how hops are meant to taste in this style of beer um ian what are you getting out of here so it's funny that you mentioned hop executioner because i thought about that today um I, I didn't write it down in my notes but i thought about it and um also in my notes i have like hop guesses of what i think hops they will use some of these breweries they'll, they'll they'll let you in on the cheat sheet a little bit and they'll tell you what hops they use and sometimes they won't uh i was 60 minute ipa i could not find what they use but i wrote down my guesses and they included um nugget chinook centennial and simcoe hops and i noticed chinook centennial simcoe hops are used in hops executioner so that's mm -hmm. where i got that match there um yeah, which makes me think i might be right on some of that stuff with that makes me feel like a professional uh, right now. <laughs> yeah. It's not. Just for the record, we got a question about subtweeting hops executioner. About uh, what Justin hops executioner? If we were subtweeting hops executioner, Justin and I have talked about hops executioner a lot. It is, it is a high variance beer. Like good off the keg hops executioner remains a like top tier West Coast IPA, but you know I don't think it's really a secret in the beer community writ large that terrapin has had some canning issues um, well it was go, yeah go ahead or, or they've had some they've had some qc issues at yeah. least like they've had some quality control issues and when you get good hops executioner it is one of the better west coast ipas in the country it's just they're the good the variance between good and bad hops executioner like bad mm. hops executioner unintentionally tastes like a hot bomb like a stone like arrogant bastard ipa uh, whereas like, and it shouldn't, you know, yeah. uh, whereas good hop executioner is just amazing. Like, uh, you know, a lot of the people that are about my age in their early thirties think, um, who went to UGA had a lot of experience of like going to Terrapin and just paying $8 for five beers or whatever. And, uh, hop executioner like back then, I mean, and I, I know this is a little bit of nostalgia, but I, I, I really do think that like at its best, it's excellent, but it is not always at its best, especially recently. <laughs> I was looking back through yeah the qc issues are uh, I'll, before they were purchased by miller cores um they had some issues where beer was sitting in the warehouse for too long and so and they were all bottles as well so if you remember back to the beginning of this episode we were talking about things that beer hates the most are light heat and uh co2 uh not co2 excuse me oxygen and so bottles have a much bigger headspace um they're also see-through so light can get in there and glass is not good for heat either and so um, hops hate all those things. Beer hates all those things. Um, and those, those beers will oxidize a lot faster. And so that's why you get that high, um, kind of variability with hop executioner because it is so hopped. It has so much hops in it. Um, it yeah. is, it is chewy. <laughs> it well, lingers yeah. and stays with you for a long time. I, hmm. I actually think there's I don't, I don't know what the i don't have the flavor compounds i think another reason people don't like hops or don't like ipas is not just the hoppiness it's that ipas do have a very like it's like the same reason that little kids don't like brussels sprouts yeah it's that sort of like very vegetable -y, like you know what i mean like this sort of like funk of like 
cooked vegetables like mm-hmm. that i think is a a flavor that comes through in a lot of ipas and it's it's funny the reason why the style has changed so much is because brewing technology has gotten so much better over the years because you could put a bunch of hops it's like putting spice on meat that was kind of going bad or you're dry aging meat to make it taste better um if it's not a great cut of meat you can put different things on it if you load a beer full of hops it's going to taste like those hops and you can say that's what it's meant to taste like and so that's one way of disguising off flavors or disguising maybe your equipment's not working the way you want it to your equipment's older than it should be et cetera. Et cetera. Um, but brewing technology has been become more accessible uh and better over the years and so you're getting beers like we have now that are so fruity and very specific um and you can say beers taste like things like passion fruit and not just cannabis couch. I'm getting the, yeah, I had, Ian, I had some Ian, of those. yeah, Ian, you don't seem, do you not like this beer? Am I reading into your experience further than I should be? No, I, I think it's fine. Uh, okay. It's just more of IPA is just generally not the first thing I reach for. Yeah. Um, I, you know, um, Nathan mentioned earlier that, um, uh, juicy IPAs or what have you are a little overrated and a little oversaturated in the market. I take it a step further and say IPAs in general are a bit overrated and a bit oversaturated. Um, I'm not a seltzer person, but at the same time, I'm glad to see that seltzer is the new darling of craft breweries because I want something else to replace IPA for a while. Um, yep. That being said, um, this is a good one. And um, I, the last time I had 60 Mini IPA was like a year. So it was nice to have this again. Yeah. Absolutely. 60, and you want something that's a lot more like coffee forward bitter. The 90 minute and the 120 minute are sort of like They'll the mess same you up. ballot. They will, but they, they definitely like drinking 120 minute uh, Dogfish Head is like having a cup of cold coffee. Yeah. Like it is that level of thickness. It is like like incredibly chewy. Also, would recommend. Do y'all want to do this Maduro thing and yeah. get out of here before we embarrass ourselves? <laughs> <laughs> I have some, yeah, I've somehow drank oh, um, most of my three beers. And so, yeah, here we are. But uh, yeah, the last beer we have is Maduro from Cigar City. It's going to be a Florida beer. Um, yeah, like, man, you're talking about Dogfish Head. And I, I just really, I, I respect the hell out of Dogfish Head because they just make good beer. But they are one of those breweries. There are some breweries now, like, um, I forget who makes it. Who makes Pliny the Elder? I don't remember. But Pliny the Elder uh, was... Shoot, I'm, that's going to drive me crazy. You can look it up for me, but um, I'll keep talking about it until you find it. But Pliny the Elder was was a uh, it was the very first brewery to make the double IPA, but they Russian made a River. Russian River. Thank you. Um, they made a double West Coast IPA, and so it was was this, but just bigger. So it was essentially Hop Executioner. Hop Executioner, for all intents and purposes, is like a double or triple IPA, but I don't think it's called that if I'm if I'm not mistaken. But it was made back then before the craze of like fruit forward IPAs and that sort of thing. Um, and, but, but dogfish head and, and Pliny the elder too, they're both beers, uh, that have to be made the same way forever, essentially, because people know them as that, even as trends change and technology changes and, and grows, they're going to have to stay the same way because that's what people expect them to be. Um, if, we do, if we do another one of these, another uh, uh, a beer, that made me think of a beer I really want to get on the list if we do another one of those is uh, some of that uh, Anchor Brewing. Like, yeah. Uh, steam. Those are um, neat. Yeah. I don't know. Have you guys ever had Merry Christmas from Anchor? Um, I'm not sure. Mary, it's What is it? Merry Christmas and Happy New Year? Hold on. They make some very interesting beers uh, and the way yeah, they make so, the beers. Yeah, so Anchor Brewing has this thing called Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and they make only a certain number of them each year. And it is just like a pine tree. It is like a beer that is a Christmas tree. And I would heavily recommend, this is like my one, like when you have to uh, nav- navigate whether or not you should go home for Christmas or whatever, and your parents are like, it doesn't matter. And you're like, there's a respiratory pandemic. And then your parents are like, oh, we still <laughs> want to see you. Not that I'm experiencing that. But um, when you were having that problem, Go get a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. It is, I think, the best uh, holiday beer I've ever had. It is, it is like drinking a pine tree in in a good way. It is like, it is like the way that a Christmas candle smells. It tastes. So this very last beer we have is the Cigar City Maduro Brown Ale. This is another one of those beers that is like a signature 
uh, style, uh, of the style, a signature beer of that style. Um, it is a brown ale made with much darker malts. So you're going to end up getting a much darker beer. Um, it's essentially completely opaque. Um, and it's going to have a lot more like mapley, um, woody, coffee, things like that are kind of what we're going to get out of this most likely. Um, it is also on the drier end of things. And, and you're going to see that with any beer that I reach for is going to be a drier beer. It's going to be a lower ABV because I like drinking beer and I want to drink more of it. Um, the lower ABV is going to allow me to drink more of those. And also they're not super sweet. There's some out there that are like cloyingly sweet. The more, the higher the ABV gets since you have to balance the alcohol. Um, this one's also made with flaked oats, which is going to have a similar effect to uh, lactose. And so with those flaked oats, it's going to give a more pillowy, soft mouthfeel without adding extra sugars necessarily, or a lot of sugars. Um, and that's said there right there on the can. But let me know what y'all get on this one. Ooh, I have spilled my beer. <laughs> well, I get more coffee out of this than I did earlier today. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of coffee. I get um, <clears throat> this might be the power suggestion, and I've also been to this brewery and I know where it is and what it's around. But I do get a little tobacco. I get mm -hmm. a little of like like pipe tobacco, kind of like like you know, there's like that leathery sort of like pipe tobacco smell. It kind of reminds my dad used to smoke a pipe when I was younger, and it kind of reminds mm. me of like. But I definitely get more coffee. Have you guys ever smelled like? I guess this is this is the the problem with like you were saying everyone's perception is their own. Like I've actually been to this brewery and it's in this place called Ybor City in Tampa, which is the sort of uh, old world traditional Cuban section of Tampa, mm -hmm. and it is right in the middle of like three cigar factories, and it is surrounded by like old eighty year old uh, Cuban grandmothers who have these little like what you, we would think of as hot dog carts, but you they like are hand rolling cigars in them. Um, and it just reminds me of the smell of, like, dried tobacco. Because uh, that's what I associate with this. It is so nice. That's it awesome. is such a nice, nice beer. Tell us all about it, Ian. Oats and sweet combined together to get this one. Um, not much uh, head to this one. Um, mm -mm. Comes and goes as soon as you pour it. And... Um, Remember, I had this with my dad one time, and he was Coke, Coke Cola, of course, mm -hmm. not the other one. And, uh, yeah, that's probably what, what you get out of the um, uh Was it Nathan earlier that said you got a little uh, from Chance? A little bit of what from Chance? Uh, wood. Uh, it may have been, yeah. Yeah. So I get more wood with this <clears> one um, on, the, on those few short sniffs and then the longer sniff. Nice, sweet, bitter balance of chocolate and toffee. Uh, coffee is there, but it's more subtle. Um, and I'm you know, just now getting coffee. I didn't, did not get that earlier today. I, I get the toffee. I get a little bit of like, not like a little campfire, like not super smoky, but there's like the burnt wood a little bit. Um, I can see that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I like this one is interesting. It's Toblerone, man. This is just Toblerone. Some sometimes like a taste experience brings you back to a very specific time in your life. My grandmother, who is honestly the worst gift giver I've ever met, um, but <laughs> <laughs> the exception to that rule is that she gives me a Toblerone for my birthday and for Christmas each year, like the big kind. Um, and it is just this reminds me of opening that and eating it and enjoying the hell out of it. And this is fantastic. It, I was telling you guys off air, but like in a, in a much less healthy time of my life when I wasn't trying to run like 10 miles a, a, a week or whatever, I was, I had, I sort of dabbled in cigar smoking and this just tastes like a cigar to me. Like yeah. it doesn't taste like tobacco, but I, I think the Maduro thing, like Maduro is a type of, of, of cigar. Mm -hmm. Maduros are like, um, like the sort of medium, like medium bold cigar tobacco flavor. But like the the balance of very sweet front to very sort of like leathery, almost like um, woody uh, back, 
that is like the way a cigar tastes. Mm -hmm. And I, like, I'm having a hard time getting past that. And I don't know that it actually tastes like tobacco, but I think there is a very intentional like play, flavor profile <laughs> profile in place here that like is referencing a cigar, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. It envelops your mouth the same one way cigar, cigar smoke do. does. Yeah. What's that, Ian? That I noticed with this one. So take a sip of this and swish it around in your mouth because what I get is two different flavors on the tip of the palate and on the back of the palate. And I don't get that with any other beer that we've had so far. Um, the tip of the palate <clears throat> uh, brings a lot of the sweetness of the chocolate and uh, toffee. The mm. back of the palate uh, gets smoother at the end with coffee. It really does. You get like it's a, a creaminess brighter. in the back. Yeah, it's a lot brighter at the front. It's like a very like... You know, like almost uh, when you have like milk chocolate and it's so sugary that it's almost like a little tart. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? I get a lot of that in the front, but then you're right. There is like sort of a like coffee creamer sort of texture to the back of it. <clears throat> Definitely. Yeah, nice. Like a coffee and a bit of half and half. Not too much half and half. Just a touch. Yeah, just a touch. Just right. All right, boys. Well, that's we've... damn good. <laughs> I think we did a good job. I think we introduced people to uh, like what it's like to be a white guy with a beard who talks about beer. Um, yeah, all three of us. Will, look at us go. <laughs> look at us. Look at us. We're doing the thing. So we will. We will probably do. Uh, Justin and I's plan is to do some more sort of specialty episodes like this. Uh, we are gonna sort of mine our Discord people for all their, their talents and, and all their <laughs> talents. Um, we very well may have Ian Ian back on to talk about mid latitude cyclones. Uh, because Ian is a NWS uh, meteorologist, and I, I I just want to talk about mid latitude cyclones because I spent a lot of time in my weather and science classes thinking about them. Um, but we are going to have some just I think, you know, at this point it's pretty clear that the college football season is at the very best going to be kind of erratic for the next four or five weeks. Uh, we'd like to continue to bring you Chapel Bell Curve content. We want to continue to bring our patrons content, but we're going to try to do that in sort of a a way that is going to be independent of the games and sometimes because we don't know when the games are going to be played or if they're going to be played. So yeah. expect to see maybe another beer episode. Uh, God only knows if I can get a college March or a marching band episode together, or maybe we can get a theater episode together. Um, and, you know, we will be back soon and we hope that you'll come back and join us. And we hope that if you liked what you saw here today, that you will hit us up on chapel bell curve doc, or sorry, patreon.com forward slash chapel bell curve. To get on our discord because what we just did for the past hour that is basically what our discord is 24 hours a day um if you like what you hear enough that you want to follow us i am at nathan j lawrence and at shuffle bell curve um and justin is at the justin bray and then ian is at ian boatman uh uga I'm right on that ian yes sir <laughs> all right well we will catch you i guess wherever you live this weekend because there's yeah. no uga game but until then, go, go dogs. dogs. Go dogs. <laughs>